Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Well, we're eager to continue in our study of the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter four. Uh, we'll begin with verse 13 tonight. So get your Bibles ready. Uh, let's get right into it. But let's say hello to everybody first. That's look. Sister Renee, they call you the untwisted sister. They all yes, pawn it off on them. <laughs> hey, you guys. Oh, sorry, I got rain in my hair. It's pouring out here. Just got in from church. But I'm looking forward to the study tonight. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have said they. I should say I. But I'm hoping I'm hoping that everybody catch it catches on and everybody does. <laughs> get recognized. When we get that new artwork done from uh, uh, Gia or Chris Andy, they're, they're working on the artwork. So uh, we'll have some new icon for you that's going to be picture this untwisted sister. Awesome. I, I plan on putting that at the beginning of all the videos I do that are specifically about verses. Yeah. Awesome. Be good. Okay. All right, Brother Ben, why don't you say hello to the congregation? Hello, everyone. It's good to be here uh, once again on this Wednesday to study the scriptures together, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, well, let me just make a, 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 an announcement uh, before we get into the study. Uh, maybe some of you uh, have already noticed this, but um, Church for the Truth uh, now has a wrench. He's a moderator. That means that he, in, in this church, he is a deacon. And so we're very happy to be able to uh, uh, trust him with this uh, responsibility. And uh, I'm sure that he'll be a big help to uh, the, the other uh, moderators we have. So uh, blessings to you, brother. Thank you for your, your help as a, as a deacon moderator in CES. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's get started in the uh, chapter 4, verse 13. It says in the KJV, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, you know, I, I want to pull up a verse here. You know, there's a common uh, twisted verse people use, and it is, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. When I was uh, a man, I put away childish things, right? And But that is not just saying, you know, when we should grow up and stop being childish. It's actually talking about us in this flesh as mortals being children and that we won't be fully mature until we stand face to face with Jesus, until that perfect comes and we see him face to face. And so that's what this reminds me of here. When I, I want to go up a couple verses, it says he, the context here is unity. Uh, he's uh, trying to keep people from thinking the, uh, their gift is more or less important, as well as Jews and Gentiles being different. They need to be one and in unity, one new man neither Jew nor Greek, but one new man in Christ in unity in the body of Christ. So that's the context here. And it says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so that is about our maturity uh, and growing. And when it talks about a perfect man or he was perfect in the sight of God, it doesn't mean that they were sinlessly perfect. It means they were mature and they were upright in their heart. Uh, so it, it doesn't, uh, it also means they had faith in the living God as well. Everybody's been justified by faith in the sight of God uh, since the beginning. But it it's saying till we all come to unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness 
of Christ. So this is uh, about how all the gifts are necessary. All the positions are necessary for the work of the ministry, for God's work to be done here on earth. Hey, amen. Thank you, sister. Appreciate the context. Um, yeah, it, it's it's so important that uh, we we not only take the context uh, of the preceding verses and the following verses, but there's a greater context of the the entire book of Ephesians. And then there's the greater context of the the Bible as a whole. Uh, so we certainly can't have a, a principle of being taught and established and then when we look further see that wait the rest of the bible it does not agree with that so that's why we've got to uh use the, the whole context before we come to any conclusions um brother ben uh, would you give me your thoughts on that verse 13 sure um i that what you just said is a perfect segue to what i wanted to talk about and that is using scripture to interpret scripture and a lot of times using a lot of people take a verse i believe and uh, make a doctrine out of it uh and when yet that same uh passage is compared to another similar passage uh it, it uh it makes that passage clearer uh, both passages passages clear like it's a it's a missing puzzle piece i believe scripture is precise and for me personally i demand precision in my interpretation i don't want any speculation or anything else i think that uh I always aim for accuracy and precision, so I know exactly what what the author is intending to say. Um, and so, this is the last time I'll bring this up. But um, one thing I wanted to mention before, and I mentioned this last week, is that uh, Romans twelve talks about spiritual gifts, and one of the things it says is that God has given to each man a measure of faith, and then he goes to, goes on to proceed uh, to talk about the different spiritual gifts, and. Uh, and that they're they've been divvied up or distributed to believers and believers only in proportion uh, to the faith. And again, the the passage there is not referring to because a lot of people say Romans twelve is talking about God gives everyone a measure of faith. And I, again, I don't think that's what the context is suggesting at all. I don't have a problem with that. Again, if someone believes that that as long as he gives everyone um, believer unbeliever like a measure of faith. Uh, I'm okay with that. I, but again, I, that's not what I believe the, the passage is teaching. It's teaching, I believe, that it's a measure of gift, of spiritual gift in the faith. And the faith is not personal faith, but rather the the faith, uh, the, the the body of Christian truth. So uh, the, uh, everything that the, the, the Bible teaches about Christ uh, is the faith, essentially. And I was making the case that, again, Romans 12 talks about God giving each one a measure of gift, spiritual gift in the faith, in proportion to the faith. Um, and uh, and this verse here uh, in, Ro in Ephesians 4.13 is basically summarizing that. And because we talked about previously, to kind of recap what we talked about last week, was that God, uh, Ephesians so far has been talking about God uh, reconciling all things in Christ, and that also Christ uh, uh, Christ is, is to believe, believers who have been redeemed he also gave spiritual gifts and so a spiritual gift is almost like a, a piece of christ a unique piece of christ that he gives to different believers um and the whole reason for, for doing that is that we as believers the body of christ the church may come to the full unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to a perfect man which basically means a, a mature man to the measure, now again, measure of faith, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So together, all these spiritual gifts, if you take them all together, they represent the fullness of Christ. We as believers in the body of Christ represent the full and the, the, the measure and the full stature uh, of Christ. And that's why God gave us these gifts. Um, so again, it's not, a, it, it's not a measure of faith. It's a measure of spiritual gift in the faith. Um, the faith of Christ, um, or faith in Christ, either way, how you want to say it. Uh, but the, again, he did this so that we could be mature in Christ, that we as the body of believers could become a perfect, mature, uh, healthy man, new man in Christ. The, again, the, the, the church is the body of Christ, and we are each 
individual members of that body. And for the next several verses, Paul is going to be expounding on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, brother. Amen. Very good points. Uh, this uh, term, the faith, uh, as you pointed out, uh, there's a, dis a definite distinction in between the term the faith and simply faith. The faith, as you said, uh, represents uh, uh, the, 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 the body of belief, uh, the, the, the beliefs that we all have come to agree upon uh, let's call it the in this, in our case we'll call it the core doctrines that's the essentials of, of the faith. Um, so it's not talking about a, a personal uh, person's faith, uh, individual faith. We're talking about the, the the faith that we've all agreed upon. This is what the faith is. This is what Christianity is. So uh, I think it is important to uh, understand that that word the. Uh, definitely changes uh, changes uh, your, your um, uh, the, the point that's being made. Uh, now, when we back up and it talks about uh, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and so on, and then it says that till we all come in the unity. So till, of course, is short for until. I'm looking at it, and I've got. Five, translate, five translations up, and I've compared four of the five um, uh, you know, have a, translated as until. So uh, until means that something is in effect, and at a certain point, it's not until. Something changes. Uh, so at this point here, we can see that uh, till we all come in the unity of the faith, well, until. Something's changed. What has changed? I think it's what was talking about earlier, the fact that we have this um, uh, this classification of um, the, the gifts and, and the, the, the parts of the body. Uh, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and so on. This, I think, will end. Uh, now, some of the things that uh, I, I, when you hear me Either teach or you know, offer uh, uh, my thoughts on 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 the scriptures. Some of the things uh, I, I say are it's long time established beliefs I have, and then other times it's something that just came to me just now as we're studying together. And so uh, I, I this is what just came to me. So without having really studied to hash it out to be sure of myself. Um, I'd like everybody's feedback on this, but I, do you think that uh, when it says till, that means that in the future, that I, I'm talking about the resurrection and off into eternity, and the new heavens and new earth, at, at that point in time, we're not going to have this apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. There's going to be something else that will not, uh, those roles will not apply at a certain point. <clears throat> now, I'm going to read it in the Amplified and see if it helps at all. Uh, it says, um, for verse 13, until we all reach oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, uh, growing spiritually to become a mature believer, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity. I think the way that they've translated there, they're really interpreting and applying it more to a, a, a person in a personal way, talking about an individual's faith and, and growth and maturity. Whereas when we when, if we interpret it the, the way I did in the beginning, the faith, uh, then uh, I would say that it's talking more about uh, the. Uh, the, the church as a whole rather than individuals reaching some level of maturity. That's why I think it's saying, when it, when we, it says until, I don't think it's until I personally mature to a certain level. I think it's talking about until the body of Christ now is as uh, 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 no longer the body of Christ in, in the way it is now, but now there's a resurrection, there's glorified bodies, there's new heaven, new earth, there's eternity, and uh, that's what I think that is, is saying that at that time, uh, things are going to be different. Uh, so I'd like to get your your uh, 
reaction to that, since I haven't really thought this through, what do you think? Uh, I guess I can answer. Um, you make a good point. Um, I, I could see it going both ways um, because he says, till we all come. So it, it does seem like it, there's a personal element to it, especially given what he says in the subsequent passages. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. But um, but I also see it from a, a, a corporate perspective as well and from a uh uh, a regenerative, a regenerative, re regenerative. I don't know what the word is. Uh, from a, from a new man perspective as well. Um, I I also kind of see personally. I know it's probably not going to be popular, but I tend to see that there there are twenty spiritual gifts. I I see ten that were temporary and twenty that are uh, ongoing. Uh, like ten were ten were temporary for the uh, initial building or built laying the initial foundation. Uh, for example, the apostles. I don't think God's set, sending out apostles anymore. Uh, but uh, um, I, I can see. I can see it both ways. I, I can see it both ways. I need more time to think about that, though. Um, so, but it, right. it, 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 let, me, let me ask Renee if, uh, if I, I might have just confused everybody. I don't know if I'm really making any sense. But uh, Renee, if you understood the point I was making, what do you think? Uh, uh, do you think that uh, there's going to be Apostles and pastors and teachers that are off in in eternity. Uh, yeah, that's hard to say. It depends on what your view of the millennial kingdom is. If you believe there are mortals still here, uh, and some are still in fallen flesh or not, and need the gospel, even though Jesus is here ruling and reigning. So well, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're not arguing about uh, the millennial kingdom. Uh, the very, I'm saying, just asking about kingdom. in eternity. Do you think yes, in eternity? Going to be that. I know what you're saying, but that also depends on someone's view of the millennial kingdom. If they're necessary or not, why would you need apostles to be sent if if there is no kingdom to preach to? Like if there's no people lost that need it, you know. So I I don't know. Um, it sounds like no. It sounds like this will be done until there there's a time where it's cut off, maybe. Uh, at least for this specific purpose. Um, but I will say that there's two things going on here. It sounds like Paul is speaking in the sense of the church itself, this church of Ephesus being brought to a place of maturity and unity with everyone working together in these different capacities and growing up and maturing to perfection, to a place where God is pleased with where they are, right? In addition, I believe it refers to how uh, a person uh, grows individually. Uh, and then I, I go over to 1 Corinthians 13, and I just want to, for anybody that might feel condemned, Paul says none of us will be perfect. None of us have all the answers. None of us are a perfectly mature Christian until we leave this body of death. And it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So that might answer your question right there, Brother Luke. That which is in part shall be done away. We might not need these positions of apostles and teachers and evangelists anymore. Uh, what, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Again, this is referring to us being children right now in this fallen flesh, but one day being a mature man, as it were, uh, perfect when we see him face to face for now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So uh, I think it's it's clear here that it's God's will that the church as a, as a whole and as an individual grow up into perfection, which is actually just mature and everybody's on the same page and under the right doctrines. Uh, and, but 
that nobody will be individually perfect until we see him face to face. Mm -hmm. So as far as your question goes, I think we can say probably not. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to verse 14 now in the KJV. It reads, um, Ben, I guess you go first on this one. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Uh, I guess I'll stop there. Wow. Uh, this, uh, this verse here is quite timely as far as the uh, some of the recent uh, uh, arguing that's been going on. So uh, go ahead, Brother Ben. Well, okay, so to, to follow up on your last question is uh, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Again, I believe the spiritual gifts are there for us to mature. That That's the idea is that not only mature individually, but in, in mature as a church um, uh, corporately. And, and and that's why this verse here, 14, says that we be, that we should no longer be children. That's in contrast to the perfect man. The spiritual gifts are to build us up, edify us, allow us to, to enable us to grow in the knowledge um, and the stature of Christ. Uh, and because if we, we don't have, if we did not have the spiritual gifts uh, it, or didn't use them, if we didn't have them or didn't use them, then we, we could, uh, we are in danger of becoming uh, like children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, and so, again, the, the idea is that these, these gifts are given so that we not, are not, not only that we have them to mature, but that we use them to mature. And when, when a Christian is not maturing, he is going to go back and forth with every wind of doctrine because he's he's not going to keep in remembrance the knowledge that he, he once uh, had or received or not understand it. And so he is going to be susceptible to the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting of people who wished to, to bring in uh, false doctrines. Uh Sometimes they bring them, uh, you know, purposefully. They know exactly what they're doing. Sometimes they themselves are deceived. Um, but but with the spiritual gifts, uh, especially in the early church, God, God gave them to the gave them to the church so that they, you know, so we would have the apostles, the teachers, the evangelists, etc., so that we would we could not be deceived or would not be deceived by uh, by the trickery of men. Um, the spiritual gifts could, should keep the church. Uh, from such deception is what I, I believe it, that that uh, is being related there. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, I just copied and saved a, um, a question that we got from Chess Champ. So I just posted it here. So if you could save that, brother Ben, and so that we can include that as one of the questions, I think that's what we should answer on a Sunday program. Okay. So Chess Champ, uh, the, the question you asked, we're going to save it. And, and we'll get to that on one of the Sunday broadcasts because it, it's not really relevant to what we're talking about right now. Uh, all right, Sister Renee, the, verse 14. Yes, uh, this is this is an important one. All right, so the reason we, uh, we need to be on one page here and in unity and mature is that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Okay, we see early church heresies, and they are still around today. We were just talking about Pelagianism the other day, that God's grace is really him giving the ability for you to pretty much earn your own salvation. Nothing new. Nothing new. Uh we need to have the right foundation, which we know is Jesus alone. He is the foundation. And then the doctrines need to be built up from there. And, and basically the doctrines are who Jesus is, what he accomplished, and what is the proper behavior for a believer in Christ. That, that's what the doctrine's all about, how uh, we need to be viewed by the believers and unbelievers alike as extraordinary 
a light to the world, uh, more loving um, than and how we need to uh, represent the name of Christ as ambassadors for Christ. But there's also important doctrines in the sense of who Jesus is as well. Our uh, theological doctrines, our foundational faith doctrines. Um, but you can see Paul's epistles were fixing those doctrines and also correcting behavior that was wrong and why it was wrong. Since we have liberty, how to not use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. So I, I can speak for myself when it says we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. I was on fire for God. It's very easily to have a zeal of God. We see these religious Pharisees have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. OK, so they might be very religious, but they don't they're they're not going about it the right way. Uh, so when I when I got back into my faith and on fire for God, I got, I fell into sway into and fro with wind of doctrine. I was told by the Hebrew rooters that I really didn't love God unless I was keeping the Jewish feast. So I fell into Hebrew roots because they were telling me I didn't love God and he was thinking I didn't love him. So I fell into that in my ignorance, not realizing that we're complete in Christ. I also fell into the Pentecostal movement, the charismania movement. So it was out of my zeal that I swayed to and fro because I wasn't stable yet. And that's what uh, Paul is saying here. He wants us in unity with sound doctrine, everybody on the same page, that we aren't children that can be manipulated by clever false teachers. That's that's what he's saying. All right. Thank you. Well, your your statement there begs the question. Um, before you were blown around to, in every wind of doctrine, uh, did did you understand uh, and and believe uh, enough that you were actually saved? Oh yes, yes, yeah. of course. But but I had uh, I understood what saved me, but I was tricked into thinking that oh, but I'm not showing God I love Him. Unless I, I, I'm doing these things. You see what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Not understanding the scriptures that we're complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. And now I think it's an insult to him to think anything we're doing is actually making it better. You know, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I, I was saved, but it was easy to fall into it because of my desire and love for God. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Saved. So are you uh, claiming that you got saved and following that? You went into error? Yes, I did. Absolutely. Is that actually possible? I believe it is. We yeah. can we have our faith shipwrecked. We can yeah. stay to and fro with everyone to doctrine. We can leave the foundation of what saved us and, be, and have to be reminded of how we were saved mm -hmm. by uh, hearing of faith and not the works of the law. You know, I, I, I think that is possible. Absolutely. But it's not God's will. He doesn't want it. You know, he tries to tell us how to avoid it by studying and coming to like mind on these matters. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the way I was asking you the question uh, is it, it's just relevant to the, 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 the recent uh, problems we've dealt with. But but it's also a, a rhetorical question I asked you. And I, I know that, uh, yeah, you are you are saved. You you you. Uh, had the simplicity that is in Christ. And, and, and so you were saved. Uh, and not only did you then get into error, but you're not an unusual or unique person in this case. Uh, it, it's quite common. And it's really all too common, unfortunately. Uh, I, I think that there are many people they get saved with the, just the, 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 the simplest understanding that uh, uh, God became man, Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross to pay for my sins. And uh, b because of that, I get to go to heaven and have eternal life because of what he's done for me. Uh, and and it's, not, it's not complicated. It's not a, a uh, like you, you don't have to read a whole book on theology. Uh, you don't even have to read the, the, the whole Bible or even 
part of it. You could probably, uh, I think you could understand enough just from a little conversation with a person. Maybe you can understand enough just from a little Bible tract that gives you this basic information. So it's not necessary to become a theologian uh, be before uh, we ha have enough uh, understanding to be saved. So we, once you get saved, though, I think what happens quite often is that people start going to church. And uh, unfortunately, they're not qualified to, to uh, scrutinize churches and determine the right church and the wrong church. And it's uh, I would say that 90% of the churches in America are the wrong church. They, they don't even believe in the real gospel. And among, among a dozen other problems, we could make a list of uh, with churches in America. Uh, so uh, it's quite common for someone to come to faith and get saved and through the simplicity of this in Christ Jesus and, and then go to a church and then get uh, led uh, astray into false doctrines because most churches are lordship churches uh, and the, the babe in Christ is totally unequipped to argue with someone who studied the Bible for decades. Uh, not only are they unequipped to do it, but they, most cases, would never dare to challenge someone who studied for so many years and, and they haven't even read the Bible yet. And they're, they're just a, a, a beginner. How are they going to uh, stand against someone who seems to be an expert? So they end up falling into these false doctrines, uh, and it, it's tragic, uh, but it, it doesn't affect the person's standing. Their standing before God is still a born-again, a saved child of God uh, that's now gotten into error. Now, uh, so many of you know, if you've been listening to me very long, I've been on YouTube for about 13 years now, but uh, uh, you're probably aware that over the years, uh, I on a, maybe a, a handful of cases, I've changed my position. Uh, I think we should be willing to change. We should be able to uh, admit if we are wrong and uh, if someone shows us our error, we should be able to be humble enough to uh, say, okay, you showed me my error. I'm not gonna be a stubborn fool and hold on to my error. Uh, I'll just thank the person for correcting me. and and. Um, uh, but I would say before we, we change our mind, particularly about, uh, you know, the, uh, the traditional positions that the church has held throughout history, before we move away from orthodoxy, I, I could phrase it that way, we need to be very slow to move away from orthodoxy. We don't want to change on a whim. I think that's what this is talking about here, the way that it's written. Um, let me read it again. It says, uh, um, that, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, okay, so this is a person that is just changing their mind back and forth on a whim uh, based on everything that are told. They just, okay, I'll, I'll embrace that. No, we need to be Berean and take our time to study. Some of the positions that you've, uh, you've seen me uh, uh, change my mind upon guess what? It was not uh, on a whim. Uh, it was a year or more of study and arguing privately with someone behind the scenes. Uh, and before I was in a position where I said, okay, I have no choice. They've proven me wrong. And uh, I, now I have to change my position. But we should resist changing our positions and be very slow to do it. But we've got some people, quite a few people out there who are using the slight of man and cunning craftiness trying to deceive us. Some people are trying to deceive us because their their motivation is evil. And other people, they're quite sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. Um, all right, uh, Renee or, or Ben, you want to say anything more about verse 14? Uh, yeah, there's someone had asked a question relevant, you know, why do we need to mark and avoid those that teach a uh, wrong doctrine like that? Well, for instance, in scripture, there were a couple of guys, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who went around telling the saints that the resurrection had passed already. And it says it over, overthrew the faith of some and their word doth eat as a canker. So the reason is it eats away at the faith of the saints. 
These people were laying down their lives. They were being persecuted. They were being fed to the lions. We were hearing about martyrs in the church tonight. We forget what they were facing. They can't afford to have their faith shaken up like that. This was life and death. It still is. And so a false teacher can come in with a incorrect doctrine, for instance, that the, the resurrection passed. It, it took away their hope of a resurrection. It took away the hope of the gospel of a bodily resurrection. So, yeah, we, we need to shut that down. And that's why it's to protect the saints. They can't walk in power if they're shaking in their boots and their faith has been stripped away. Oops. Any more, Ben? Uh, well, the thing I would add is that, um, yeah, Renee's actually uh, totally right. I mean, one thing I, I definitely underestimated uh, for many years is the spiritual battle we're, we're in and the cunning of the deception, the cunningness of the deception, where, you know, someone may, may sound, look very, sound very nice, very pleasant, very sincere, uh, the nicest person you could ever meet, yet they could be teaching falsely, even 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 subtly, a very subtle falsehood uh, that can really uh, distract you or, or catch you off, uh, it, it trip you up, essentially. And um, we need to be aware of that and, and, and not get all our doctrine from a single person. We need to be in the word ourselves and see if the things that they say line up with scripture. Uh, because again, you can't. It has nothing to do with uh, what the person looks like. Uh, they're, you know, they could inward, inwardly they could be devouring wolves, either either purposefully or uh, unintentionally. Um, again, even like the spirit of Python, the the the, the uh, I think it was an axe where the uh, the w woman who had the spirit of Pythia, spirit of Python, she was even saying, uh, "Hey, these men ha uh, have the way of salvation. Preach the way of salvation. Listen to them." Something to that effect. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, but obviously she didn't. She proclaimed a salvation that she herself did not have because uh, she was possessed. Um, so again, even even evil forces can proclaim some truth, but be very wrong in other areas, and that's why we need to test the spirits and uh, see if it lines up with scripture. Mm -hmm. All right, Amen. thank you. Amen. And he didn't need that demon possessed woman aligning herself with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, ben, you used a, a word uh, or, for, or made a point that uh, I'm gonna, from my own experience, tell you about it. it. You said we should not be learning from just one teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I got I to say just from reading the Bible privately in my own home, uh, uh, as I read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and then the Gospel of John, uh, uh, I, I believed and then after I believed, you know, I, I wanted to uh, uh, keep reading the Bible and learn more. But um, I found that there was a radio program called the Bible Answer Man. And so I would listen to this radio program as I was driving to work each day that, that they came on just as I was uh, on the road. And so uh, Dr. Walter Martin hosted that program for probably 40 years. Um, and, and then I, I got Walter Martin's book, The Kingdom of the Cults. Uh, and, and then uh, I also ordered a, probably about 30 or 40 of his audio tapes on, on different messages. Uh, so I, I did really depend a lot on Walter Martin's teaching uh, uh, for so much of my theology initially. However, even before I heard about the Bible Answer Man, just in my own study, limited study of the Bible at that point, thank you, Jesus, I, I, I got the basic things right from the beginning, and it's never, it's never uh, varied, and that is, who is Jesus and how do I get saved? Those things uh, I, I saw clearly by reading the Gospel of John. Uh, the, uh, the, the other teacher that was... Uh, influenced me a lot and i've got about 40 of his books on this bookshelf here dr peter ruckman um I've, I've studied his teachings quite a bit and he's had a big influence uh, but over time i've departed from some of his positions um 
But I, I, your point about getting your, your, your uh, uh, learning from just one teacher, that's a very good thing. We should guard against that. Um, I, I think we should be willing to listen to, uh, especially listen to the people who say you're wrong. Uh, it's, not, it, it's not a pleasant thing to do a lot of times because who wants to be told that they're wrong about something? And we are, we, our defenses go up immediately and we, we want to resist it. But um, it, it, is there a chance you could be wrong about anything? Uh, if not, then you must think you're infallible. Maybe you're a pope. <laughs> so if you recognize that you are fallible, you're not omniscient, you could be wrong. Thank you, and I'm thankful that I don't have to be right about everything in the Bible. There's only a couple of things I got to get right. That, as I said, who is Jesus and how do I get saved? I could be wrong about everything else, but I better get that right. Uh, so uh, when you, be willing to listen to the people who say you're wrong and, and because you might be. And then take your, take your time and study the opposing point of view. Uh, so the worst thing that can happen is that uh, you learn the other person's position and you don't change your mind. You you still think you're right, but now at least you understand the, a different viewpoint. All right. Any more before we go to the next verse? Okay. Let's go to verse uh, 15 in the KJV. It says, uh, "But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ." Sister Renee. Yeah, uh, well, go back. Um, do we just do 15? We're just doing 15, right? Yes. Okay. So we're continuing the thought that we're, you know, that we're supposed to mature. And so we're no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with everyone to doctrine. Uh, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And when it says may grow up into him in all things, um, again, I think this is talking, uh, what, what was the word used corporately then? I think it's talking about, you know, the church as a whole and individually um, in this verse. And so the goal here is that we mature in every area and keeping Christ the center of it. He is the head, not the Pope. There is, the Pope is not the head of the church here. He's not the mediator. The, the, the church, the first century biblical church, are a bunch of individual churches planted all over the world. And they each have their own leaders or, or elders in that particular church. And then the head is Christ. But there is no corporate entity where there's the Pope and then there's Cardinals and then there's this and then there's the local church and they all come together with one giant headquarters in Rome. That is not the biblical church. The headquarters is in heaven. Jesus is the head of the church and every little individual church uh, should be growing up into him. The key here is remembering that Jesus is at the head of it all. Keep him front and center. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Ben, verse 15. Well, uh, again, just it's really just uh, to me, it's, it's another e further emphasizing that uh, the spiritual gifts were, were given uh, to believers by Christ uh, as, a, uh, as a reflection of his love. And we're used, supposed to use them also to, uh, in love, to build. Uh, up other believers and the church at, at large so that we can all uh, grow up. Like, like you said before, the point was made in thir verse 13 is that the idea of these spiritual gifts is that we uh, come to the full knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man or a mature man, to the full measure of Christ. And uh, that, and if we do so, we will not be tossed to and fro. Um, and somebody made a point in, uh, in chat earlier that especially in the early church when these epistles were being written, obviously uh, they did not, did not have all the scripture, was not yet completed. So these spiritual gifts were even all the more important um, back, in, back in the early days, in the nascent phases of, that, of the church. Um, 
And again, uh, it, 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 so the gifts were so that we could uh, grow into the full measure of Christ um, and that uh, we, we could grow up into Christ. That's what verse 15 is talking about, growing up. So we not we would not remain as children. And But even with that said, Paul said in Philippians 3, 312, where he said, I have not, not that I have already attained or, or am already perfected or mature, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And uh, then he says in verse 15 in, in, in uh, Philippians 3, therefore let us as many are, are as many as are mature have this mind. Uh, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. So the idea is that, uh, you know, even Paul said he, he had not, you know, grown up into the full maturity of Christ, but that was his goal. That's what he sought to do. And that's what we all, uh, every believer should seek to do. And the way, the way to do that is to, uh, well, obviously abide in his word. That's one of the main things, but also to fellowship with other Christians where we can each express and manifest our spiritual gifts to one another for the benefit of, of, of us all. Ben, yeah, th that verse you mentioned where he said, not as yet I had already attained. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that verse up because I have heard so many false teachers say that Paul is saying he had not yet considered himself to as obtain salvation. Wow. And it's clearly saying he had not attained perfection. He said, not as though I had already attained or had considered myself perfect or something like that. But I'm glad you brought that verse up because it is a complimentary verse about growing into perfection and maturity that he didn't even consider himself to be perfect yet, but that he was striving towards it. And people try to make it like he's striving towards uh, salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say that uh, you're glad Ben brought up the verse. I'm glad you untwisted it. Thank you. Sir. Well, not only that, but in that verse, she talked about uh, a, a, a gaining a prize, which is yeah. another word for reward. So yeah. it's not salvation; it's it's maturity and uh, a yeah. crown, essentially. Yeah, I've I've never heard it misused the way you said, Renee. But uh, I'm, I don't doubt that at all. And uh, thank you for untwisting it. Maybe we should call you the untwisted sister. Okay. I'm going to read uh, verse uh, 15 in the Amplified to see what it says. Uh, it says, but speaking the truth in love, in all things, both our speech and our lives expressing his truth. Let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. So yeah, Christ is the head. Uh, I don't think that really tells us too much from the uh, that translation, but I see there's a footnote here. So let me look at, this is verse 15 and 16, a footnote. It says, the head, Christ. Um, where Christ is identified with the whole body, including the head, the imagery may derive from ancient views in medicine, the head coordinating and caring for the body. Each ligament, perhaps the ministers, supporting the whole. Uh, uh, where the temple is depicted as a growing organism, there may also be the idea here of growing toward the capstone, Christ. Uh, you know, when I hear this word organism, uh, you many, I'm sure you've heard this saying that the Christianity, um, or the, the church, is not an organization, it is an organism. Of course, an organization is, is what Romanism has done. And, you know, some people interpret the Nicolaitans in, uh, in uh, Revelation differently, but uh, I learned from Dr. Ruckman, he said that the Nicolaitans were the people who were trying to establish a hierarchy, a, a difference between the clergy being above and lording it over the laity. And uh, and so we're warned of against that being an evil thing, and yet that's exactly what Roman Catholicism has done. In fact, Roman Catholicism just that's just their normal uh, what do you call it standard operating uh, procedure. 
Is that what it's called? SOP? Standard operating procedure is whatever the Bible says, let's establish it different than that. Like the Bible says, don't memorize and repeat mindless prayers. Let's do that. Let's create a rosary and memorize prayers and repeat them like the, 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 the pagans do. The, the Bible says, don't forbid marriage. Well, let's forbid marriage. We could go on and on, but in Roman Catholicism, they routinely uh, take what the Bible says and teach the opposite. And this is exactly the same thing here. We're not supposed to have an organization where you have uh, classes of Christians uh, and, and um, you work your way up in this uh, hierarchy and trying to achieve some kind of a political uh, position in the church so you have more power over the others. Um, and so that's what church as an organization becomes. That's what it results in. But if the church is an organism, that means it's made up of living parts. Uh, like in my body, I have trillions of cells in my body. And uh, so I am a living organism made up of small, smaller living parts. And that's what the church is. An organ is organism. Uh, a, that's why the picture and the illustration of uh, the church being the body of Christ uh, we should understand it as a living organism, and uh, we're we're the the parts of the body of Christ. Um, all right, you want to say anything more on verse fifteen, either of you? Okay, let's let's go back to the KJV verse sixteen. Uh, uh, Brother Ben, verse sixteen says, "From whom the whole body fitly joined together." and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Can you sort that out? Well, this is kind of, again, this is kind of how I see it. Again, he I, I see that word measure again. And uh, again, the measure is used as a, as a, uh, as a picture of, it, it's a fragment of Christ, essentially. Every spiritual gift is a fragment of Christ, and every believer is a kind of a fragment of Christ, if you will, a part of his body. And um, and yet we we together we form a whole body, and uh, and that the spiritual gifts again are are, are designed to uh, build up the body of Christ, so that we will not be deceived and tossed to and fro by deceivers. And what's really interesting here is um, is what he says the whole body is being knit together. So uh, we know that um, David described uh, his conception or pre-birth, uh, how God made him, that God knit him together in his mother's womb. Well, uh, so there, we have that knit, we have the idea of being formed in a mother's womb, a, a forming of a body in a mo mother's womb, essentially. We have the idea of being deceived by uh, cunning craftiness. And I see a direct parallel uh, to, to Galatians here. Uh, and we talked about Galatians when we covered that, our last epistle. We talked about, um, I believe, I think we all agreed, you have to do some serious twisting to, to suggest that the Galatians had not, that, that, that the Galatians had were not already saved. They were, had been walking by the Spirit. God, Paul calls them the sons of God, yet they had gone uh, astray because of, of the influence of Judaizers coming in and trying to insert law or impose law on them. And, and some of them, if not all of them, uh, in the Galatian church had succumbed to that teaching. And uh, but and so it, it, I believe it do some serious twisting to, to suggest that the Galatians were not uh, born-again believers who had gone astray. And that Paul was there to correct them. Uh, and it, he did very so he did so very effectively. But one of the verses that people uh, brought up about, oh, well, uh, no, the Galatians could not be saved because in Galatians 14, I'm sorry, Galatians 4, 17 through 19, Paul says, they jealously court you, speaking of the Judaizers, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them, but it is good to be zealous in a good thing always. And not only would I am present with you, then he says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. 
And they said, okay, see, they were not born again because Christ was not formed in them. And I believe that verse, uh, it, you know, it, uh, I, Paul said he's labor again, uh, labor in birth again until Christ is formed into them, in them. He's using that formed in you the same way that Paul is using formed in you here in Ephesians, where he's talking about these spiritual gifts and being joined and knit together uh, so that so that the body of Christ could grow in them, not individually per se, but corporately or uh, as an organism, as you said, uh, 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 Luke, I thought that was awesome. I never heard that before, actually. So that, that's really interesting. I think that's amazing. Um, yeah, it's a living organism. And the more that Christ grows, the more you exercise these spiritual gifts, the more you abide and grow in his word, uh, the more Christ grows in you, the fuller understanding you have of him. And so in that sense is what I believe uh, Paul was referring to in Galatians, saying until Christ is formed in you, not that they were not born again. In fact, they were formed in Christ, but now they needed, uh, there was a second birth he's talking about essentially, and that was Christ formed in them, their understanding of who he was. And, um, and so again, Paul says that the whole body is joined and knit together by uh, what every joint supplies. So the church is the new man, and it needs to grow, and that's why God gave these spiritual gifts. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I wanted to just say about that for now. But I, again, I think that's a, a, a. If you read this carefully, Ephesians, uh, this Ephesians four here about the spiritual gifts and the effect that they, the the antidote they, uh, that they uh, serve against false teaching. Um, that is the the the. Uh, parallel or a parallel in Galatians 4 about being Christ being formed in you. It's not that they weren't an indication that Christ wasn't, they weren't born again. It's just that they uh, need, they their spirit, their their uh, access to the spirit had been uh, subverted by these Judaizers because when you start trying to be justified or or walk with God in in the law, you have you have become alienated from the spirit that 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 the spiritual dynamo, the spiritual force um, and power of the Holy Spirit, you've cut it off. You, you've excluded it. They wanted, to, the, the, the Judaizers wanted to exclude them, but uh, Paul's saying, no, they need, they are the ones that need to be excluded. They they are anathema. They Anathema essentially means excluded or set apart or marked and avoided. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I think that uh, can really help understand what Christ, what P Paul meant about, in Galatians about Christ being formed in them. Okay, thank you. I, brother Luke, I would agree with Ben on being formed in. It's like it's a way of saying, okay, Christ is in you, so let's manifest it. And so uh the the thing is is the seed of Christ is in them. But they have to unlearn walking in their flesh and everything they do by instinct. And they have to hear the spirit and go against what their flesh desires. Their flesh wants to uh, not forgive, you know? And so we have to learn uh, to allow Christ to be formed in us so that we can manifest what the spirit wants. It's not that, like you said, it's not that Christ is not in us. It's that he has to be uh, allowed to take over and manifest it in our life. In our maturity, I, I think uh, it's, yeah, it's clear that's what's going on. And when it's talking about the whole body fitted jointly together, we're going back to all the individual positions here and how they all need to work together. And they've all been given a portion of uh, the, the spirit, like he, he said, the spiritual gifts to be able to fill those positions. So that the whole body works together like a machine, like a body. Um, he uses a, a physical body. He uses a brick and mortar temple. He uses many ways, a building um, to describe uh, the body of Christ being made up of many different parts. Um, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. So every position, every gift is necessary to the working of the body, make it increase of the body unto the edifying of itself 
in love. So yeah, to build it up, to strengthen it uh, so that it can function in its fullness. And as long as they are divided into Jews and Gentiles uh, and, and not working as one body, that is going to be minimized. As long as some people feel that their gifts are more important or their position is more important or this person's less important, it will not function jointly as a body functioning the way it's supposed to with Christ at the head and um, and his mission and others being uh, more important than our individual selves. And so I think he's trying to bring everything in unity here. No division between Jew and Gentiles, no division uh, amongst the positions, no division in the spiritual gifts. Everybody is just as important and necessary to the building up of the body and its function. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you're tying it all together, giving us some context again. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read it in the uh, 16 in the Amplified. It says, from him, the whole body, that is the church in all its various parts, joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up uh, un in unselfish love. Uh, well, when it starts off by saying from the, let me see, from the whole body fitly together, hitting five, Maybe I'm thinking of the previous verse. Yeah, I'm thinking of verse 15 now. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. Um, this this idea of love being so important here, uh, let me look at the 15 in the Amplified again, uh, because the word, but speaking the truth in love in all things, both our speech and our lives expressing his truth, so he's talking about the importance of love uh, as we are communicating and acting. The things we do, the things we say, it's got to always have love as the uh, the, the motor that's uh, that's making making you do everything. Uh, well, I've always had a problem with uh, the the love chapter, um, First Corinthians. Uh, is it uh, thirteen? Is it thirteen? Or is it seven? I think seven is the marriage and 13 is the love chapter, isn't it? But what the, the chapter that says that uh, of, of faith, hope, and, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity, which I think a better translation is love. Uh, so faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. Now, the reason this has always been a problem for me, uh, not that I don't believe it or, or I'm arguing against it in any way, but the scripture also tells us that that um, uh, faith is um, the most important thing. In fact, in fact, it's the only thing when it says that uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So on one hand, I see God elevating faith as the penultimate. Uh, without faith, you can't please God. You can't be saved without faith. Faith is the one requirement that God requires of us. Um, and then in the love chapter, it seems that love trumps even faith. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. And in fact, you can do everything. You can do anything. You can even be burned at the stake. But if you don't have love, it's just, uh, it has no value, I guess. I don't remember exactly how it's phrased, but it's a beautiful chapter, but it elevates love above everything else. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe someone can help me help me with this. Uh, but on one hand, I know that the, the, the only thing and the main thing that uh, is uh, for salvation is faith. And yet uh, love is, is elevated above it in uh, uh, the love chapter. And here it's saying do everything in love. All the things we do, all the things we say 
you've got to, it's got to be done with love in mind. And of course, Jesus also summed up all the commandments with love: love God and love uh, your fellow man. Um, maybe can anybody help me uh, with that? I, why is why is faith the the one requirement for salvation? I mean. There, there's people who will like to teach in philosophy and religion. They, they teach that all that really matters is love. Isn't there a song that says love is all you need? Uh, and that's what the philosophy of the world is as a whole. Oh, all you got to do is just love people. And it's not what Jesus said. Didn't Jesus reduce it down to just love? And, and yet, if you have love, but you don't have faith, you don't have salvation. But Paul also says, if you have faith, but you don't have love, it's like a clanging symbol. Well, I kind of see it as faith the the full uh, the the full manifestation or the the goal of faith is ultimately to have a pure love, a selfless love. It's like faith is the foot in the door, but love is the uh, is the, uh, <laughs> uh, the yeah. The, so love is the uh, pinnacle essentially of of that faith. Um, it's what faith is is kind of meant to evolve or not evolve, but uh transform into um i'm not 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 that uh love uh, you know worldly love is, is usually uh, i guess a, a, an unbeliever can love truly love another person but i don't know sometimes i think there's, it's tainted it's got to be tainted somehow be by uh, some kind of selfish desire um or some selfishness it's not as pure as a uh as a holy spirit uh infused love i don't know if that helps Renee, do you have any uh, answers for me? Sorry, Brother Luke, I was answering something in the chat. And I, I actually stepped away to get water, so I oh, didn't. All right. Well, I, you'll have to watch the video then because it's too complex for me to repeat the point again. But let me answer uh, uh, Heather here. Uh, let me see. She, she said, see my previous comments here. So she says, that's right. Faith in God and love for one another. Um, because God is love, and so having love is having God manifested in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I'll sum it up, Renee, as, as simply as I can. On, on one hand, uh, you can't please God without faith. You can't get saved without faith. But the love chapter says that if uh, faith, uh, faith, hope, and, and love, but the greatest is love, without love, it's like a clanging symbol. So how do you reconcile this position? Elevating love is number one. And on the other hand, elevating faith is number one. Well, here's the thing. Without, without God's love for us, there would be no gospel. Uh, that's why love is greater than all of it. Because it was his love for the world. Why he sent his son to die for us. Uh, but as far as what Paul is talking about, he's talking about us. Uh, walking in this world. So whatever we do uh, on, on this planet, if, if we don't have love, it's all worthless. If we have all understanding of doctrine, and but there's no love, it, everything is about loving others and loving God. And so um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's saying what people might think it's saying. Uh, this is more about what we do as Christians. Uh, and we see this today with self-righteousness. They might be right on most things, but it doesn't matter because nobody can stand to be around them because they don't have any love for anyone. You know, and so you, you can't be, it, everything we do is worthless uh, without manifesting love for others. Uh, the, a simple act of love can be louder than anything. Uh, and I think that Paul is just emphasizing how important it is to love people. Uh, but as far as, you know, saying it's even greater than faith, uh, that I, I believe that's about our walk. It's all about our walk and how we show up here in this world. But if it wasn't for the, for love, if God didn't love us, we would have nothing to have faith in. Okay. Uh, all right. Shall we go to the next verse? Uh, 17 in the KJV. 
think Renee, I think it's your turn first, isn't it? it? Says this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. I'll read 18 also, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And this is another uh, proof that this Ephesian church is made up of the bulk of Gentiles here. Now we know there were Jewish believers, but it looks like the, the Ephesian church was primarily a Gentile church uh, and Judaizers, because they, they seem so religious. See, we have the scriptures. We're the ones that know God. And so they would lift themselves up in a way that the Gentiles would go, ooh, a rabbi, you know, and they believe anything they said. So um, it's, it's clear here that the majority were Gentile believers here. Uh, otherwise, why would he say don't act like other Gentiles? So when he says uh, this, I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart. OK, so what's he saying here? We see it in other places. Uh, we see it where he says. And this sin, this sin, this sin, we call them the sin list. And they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom, right? You see that. And so he's basically saying, don't act like they do. Okay, so same thing here. Why would you act like people that are utterly blind, ignorant, far from God, alienated from him? Why would you mimic the behavior of people like that? And so... Uh, he's confirming that we're not to walk like the people that are puffed up in the vanity of their mind with no understanding, alienated uh, from the life of God through ignorance because of the blindness of their heart. Now, you should not be walking like people like that because the reason they walk that way is because they are blind and the heart is darkened and they are alienated from the life of God in Christ. And so... We should not walk that way. We shouldn't walk the way people that are blind and ignorant and alienated from God walk. So I, I think it's just telling them that's not who you are anymore. And the reason those people walk that way is because they are blind and they are far from God and they have no light. So you shouldn't be walking that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The unrighteous will not inherit. It's like, hey, why are you taking your cases before these unjust, unbelieving, unrighteous people? Don't you know you're going to judge angels? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. So uh, if they're not going to inherit the kingdom, why would you mimic the behavior of these people? They should not be emulated. Same thing here. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our brother Ben, 17 and 18. 17 and 18. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Paul says, uh, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. So this is not like Paul's opinion. Uh, this is something that, he, that you know, so he could say, well, Paul, you're being too stringent. We are, we already have the righteousness of God. We're positionally righteous. Um, so we can, we can do whatever we want. We can live any way we want to, which they can. But uh, he's, the, like, like Renee said, I love what she said about, and Paul does this constantly all through his epistles. He says, okay, your walk should match, you should walk worthy of your position. So your position is a saint, and so walk worthy of it. And uh, and so he's saying, don't don't walk as, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. The fact that they, he said you should no longer meant that they one time, at one time did, like we all have. We all have, uh, we all walked in darkness at one point. Um, and so, you know, so we are our walk, our the way we should conduct ourselves should not must, but should. And that's it's a very strong should. <laughs> but um, it, again, it's, it's a, not a must as in, in terms of uh, being deemed worthy for salvation. This is a, a should based on what we've already achieved in terms of our position. We should walk. Uh, we, we, we should walk as Christ walked. 
Uh, you know, we shouldn't walk as unbelievers do anymore. Um, because unbelievers, it says that they walk in the futility of their mind. A futile mind is like empty thinking. Um, empty thinking is really has no ultimate direction or understanding of God's word. And uh, it tends to orient itself towards the here and now, the temporal, rather than the eternal. Uh, it looks at the material rather than the spiritual. And uh, believers, uh, or unbelievers, typically will live for themselves, whereas believers should uh live for themselves i'm sorry should live for others and god um and then with regards to uh verse 18 it says having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of god because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart so the gentiles were uh kind of in four ways uh degenerate or in darkness they were spiritually in darkness because they were alienated from the life of God, so they had no spiritual life. Uh, they were mentally in darkness uh, because they, uh, because they're ignorant and blind to to spiritual realities. Um, they were um, emotionally in darkness because they were past feeling. They, it's like their sin didn't bother them anymore, and then they were uh, overtly. Uh, in darkness in the sense that they gave themselves over so they you know they, they had no qualms or no shame in the, the sins that they participated in they were not uh you know they didn't resist it they didn't uh think it was shameful to to do it in in uh openness uh, in fact they celebrate it just like they many since today are celebrated openly um and in fact, okay, so where he says, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, that's uh, similar to 2 Corinthians 4, 4, where Paul says, who minds the, the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And then with regards to uh, the, the, the being ignorant and blind, we know that the natural man does not welcome the things of God. Uh, which which First uh, Corinthians two fourteen says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So, uh, like Renee said, Gentiles um, prior to, to salvation uh, walk in darkness. They're blind. They in they don't they have, are will willfully ignorant, suppressing the truth, just like Romans says, and. Um, believers should walk total totally counter to that believers are to walk in the light of god's truth and his word mm -hmm. okay thank you all right i'm going to read um, 17 and 18 in the amplified by the way uh, beginning with verse 17 there's a subtitle you know a lot of the translations um they will um, uh, create a, a title for a chapter and subtitles within the chapter. Uh, th these titles and subtitles are not scripture. They're added by the publisher or the translators to just give you an idea of, okay, the following verses, this is the basic theme of it. And so uh, beginning with verse 17, the subtitle reads, The Christian's Walk. So uh, in your comments, uh, both of you re re referenced the Christian walk. So you're in agreement with that uh, subtitle. Um, and, this and there's one translation says, renewal in Christ is the subtitle. And another one says, instructions for Christian living. Okay, so what does it say? In the Amplified 17 and 18 reads, so this I say and solemnly affirm together with the Lord as in his presence, that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. For their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart. 
Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's pretty much quite an uh, a condemnation of the nature of of humanity. Uh, and yeah. Then therefore, obviously, the the great need for the new birth. Uh, you anyone want to say more about those those verses? Oh gosh, the time. Look at this. I guess we don't have time for any more verses. Uh, it's seven fifty six fifty four. So do uh, you want to say anything more about 17 or 18, either of you? Okay. I want to say walking, when he's talking about walking, I want to see, let me see how I put it here. Uh, henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. It's twofold. Uh, it's walking, it's being in the blindness, the ignorance, without Christ, but it's also mostly referring to uh, their behaviors and that the reason they have these behaviors, it goes on to describe the behaviors, is because they are blind. But I think it's twofold. Okay. All right. Um, let's start uh, summing up our, our thoughts then here. Uh, um, if there's something in the chat room that you want us to respond to as we uh, finish up here, Make your statement or question in all caps, and we'll try to include that in our in our closing remarks. Now, um, all right, uh, brother Ben, what what do you think? It, was it a good study? It certainly was, and I think we're getting into the uh, some really good parts that I I, uh, I, I like what what's coming up in the next uh, couple of verses in the next chapter, especially. Um, but we're kind of getting past the point where you know the first couple of chapters. Paul laid the fr framework or the foundation for what he's what he's now going into. Uh, um, it, 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 well, it's kind of going into the Christian walk. Uh, you know, he talked about doctrinally. Uh, you know, the foundation that Christ reconciled all things to Himself, gave us gifts, and now we are to grow up and walk in that truth. And these are very, very uh, important truths for all believers, uh, for even for young believers and for mature believers to have that regular reminder. So uh, I really like Ephesians. I'm really enjoying the study so far. All right, great. Thank you. All right, Sister Renee, what do you think? Well, if I could summarize the study tonight, I'd say unity. That uh you know, many parts working as a whole and that it won't function unless we have the proper view of ourselves and others. I was telling uh, Kevin, and by the way, I'd like to say, Kevin, you did an amazing job greeting everyone, keeping everyone on topic. It was You did an amazing, amazing job as moderator. Thank you. Uh, that I had learned this on movie sets. I was appalled at how people treated others on movie sets. They would treat the production assistants, which were, you know, the lowest on the crew, and the extras, or background actors, as we would call them. They were people without lines that were just in the background in scenes. With such contempt, some people, some of the actors wouldn't even allow them to make eye contact with them. And I thought, these production assistants work themselves to death. These background actors are out here in 110 degree heat in these heavy clothes. Some of them have their children out here to be background workers. And you try making a movie where there's no crowd or nobody walking past the camera. It wouldn't seem realistic. They're absolutely necessary to the production as a whole. So why are they treating them with such contempt? And I also noticed that everybody had a position and we had a we had a shirt made up where everybody's position was there. But the, what they really were, uh, I'm a director of photography, but I'm really a director. I'm a production assistant, but I'm really a producer. Like nobody was just what they did on the set. Everybody was ashamed of it. And then there was contempt for people lower than you. And so uh, when I when I think about it, I made sure it, when I got to the top of the totem pole, I never treated people that way. I ne I even brought drinks to the mother and her children that were in the heat working background actors. And everybody thought I was crazy. Why would the producer do that? Because they, 
everybody was so used to treating the smaller people with contempt. And to me, they weren't smaller. They were, they were just, they may not have had a, a, a glorified name or title, but they were so integral to the working of the film. And I, I see that here in the body of Christ. Nobody glorifies the little old lady that's making soup for the sick people at church. Nobody glorifies her. Nobody, you know, uh, lifts these people up that go to the homeless banks and feed them every week. They want to glorify the pastor and the theologians, but they're just as important. It wouldn't work if all of us didn't have our gifts. You know, nobody's glorifying the prayer warrior that goes in his or her prayer closet and cries out to God fervently for others. You know, so uh, what I see here is unity being preached. And it's so important that everybody realizes that God has a gift for you. He will use you. He has plans for your life. He wants to prosper you. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be part of something bigger than yourself. And we need to stop thinking it's all about us. Well, I want this gift. I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. We should want more spiritual gifts out of service for God. It says we should crave them. We should desire them, right? But it's all so that God can be glorified. So unity is important here. Nobody is more important than the other. The body uh, needs to work together. We need the hands, the fingers, the eyes, the feet. We need all of it. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the. Did anything happen in the chat room? Any any questions in the chat room here? I asked you if you had a final remark you want us to respond to. I don't see anything, so I guess there's nothing to respond to there. Uh, the um, for me the the study tonight was a little bit different in that I I feel like uh, I. I I might have had as many questions as I had answers tonight, uh, where I, I said, okay, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on this because I'm not so sure about a couple of things. So that's that's what's so wonderful about studying together. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of studies with people. I've done a lot of studies uh, all by myself, and I much prefer being uh, having a, a group discussion the, the way that we do it here. I, I get so much more out of it, and not only the uh, learning more, but uh, the, the the fellowship at the same time. So I would just say that maybe this is a lesson for everybody that if, if you spend all your time studying uh, um, by yourself, uh, you're you're really missing out. By studying with others, you gain fellowship and you gain insights that you would not have had if you were just doing it just you and the Bible and the Holy Spirit, obviously, and that's how I got saved, just just the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and me. And, uh, but uh, as you go forward, I think having uh, a group group studies is, is uh, very advisable. Uh, I guess, uh, let me ask Renee, um, are you ready to say anything about uh, your um, Thursday throwdown yet, or is that still on hold? No, it's still on hold. Okay, let, let me ask Brother Steve if uh, if if you're still there, it's not too late for you, and you and you already passed out on us. Steve, if you're there, yeah, uh, make a comment in here and let us know uh, if you have a program tomorrow night, as you have had the last few weeks, and uh, what the subject is if you're going to have it, and I'll I'll uh, announce it to everybody if you'll uh, let me know. I would say that uh, the last three weeks on Thursdays that I've been listening to these broadcasts with uh, Brother Ben and Sister Angel, and uh, they've covered a lot of ground and a lot of, a lot of great uh, uh, teaching and great insights, a very important subject that's, that's been discussed. So if you've missed uh, those last uh, three Thursdays, uh, you go to uh, – Soldier for Christ, we are at war. Maybe Steve, you can. I don't know if you can click on his link and get to his channel, or maybe Steve, you could post the link to your channel here so everybody could go and check it out. Watch what he's done, but also be there tomorrow night. Uh, tune in. What time is that anyway? Is it? Uh, is it like eight or nine Eastern time? 
Uh, yeah, we typically start at seven thirty, and uh, he plays some music. Plays some music until about eight. So the show or program actually starts at, at eight. Uh, eight Eastern. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, being with us tonight. Uh, uh, and you can join us again uh, on this channel uh, uh, Friday, 930 Eastern Time, if you want to have fun. But don't if you don't want to have fun, then you definitely don't want to come on Friday because that's what we do. It's called Fun Fellowship Fridays. So join us 930 Eastern Time on the Church of the Eternally Secure channel. All right, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.